Hello, everybody, and welcome to Atlantic Institute. Um, this is A Man Called Ove, and it's a book club um, dialogue event. And we have with us Dr. Peter Cohen, who is going to host for us tonight and um, help us lead us in conversation about the book. All right, go ahead, Dr. Cohen. Okay. Uh, the first thing that struck me about uh, book reading was um, if someone, a reader, hadn't lost someone recently or important in their life, it would be very difficult to understand what he was going through mm -hmm. uh, because it was not outrageous um, in any way, manner, or form. And his whole life was uh, living with loss, you might mm -hmm. say. Um, and that struck me, you know, quite a bit. Uh, loss of his mother, loss of his father, loss of his wife, loss of his job. Um, and uh, he was desperately trying to put order into his life. Um, and to the point of, you know, clearly over the top. You know, <laughs> my um but it was very clear that uh, this was a man who was not used to things uh, happening outside of his um, purview and uh, wanting to have, desperately wanting to have control uh, over the situation. Uh, and, um, you know, I immediately felt, you know, eight years ago, I lost my wife certainly not to the extent of OVA, but, uh, you know, those ideas, you know, what do you do? How do you um, go on with things? Uh, is very often the case, you know, in looking for something that kept you uh, focused. Uh, in his case, he didn't have any more family. Um, he um, had some interesting relationships with neighbors. Uh, needless to say, um, and um, at odds with some neighbors, but also it was interesting, um, his relationship with Rune, uh, you know, the whole time, you know, and watching the responses uh, that he had, uh, the smiling, the eyes moving toward him, um, you know, et cetera. And this idea um, that everyone, you know, the white shirts was a common theme, that everyone was out to get him. Uh, these no-name government officials that were in control. Uh, it was very, very interesting. Uh, the opening scene, uh, you know, in the book, this idea which was not in the movie, by the way, um, is him in the computer store was, you know, very, very interesting to me. You know, here's a man who um, knew things, uh, knew how to build things, how to make things. But as, uh, as far as computer literate is concerned, he was not. And uh, the kid had to help him out and he was just browbeating the poor um, uh, person in the store uh, to the point of him handing him off to somebody else. And, you know, basically the person thanking, you know, thank you a lot for giving me this customer. Um, but, um, you know, you, you have to feel for this guy. There's no question about it. Um, his wanting to join his wife um, and these attempts of suicide, which were, you know, really not that serious uh, when you looked at it. Um, but you can see how he was desperately trying to get back with her any way he could because they didn't have children um, and other things. Um, how did you feel about that? Anybody? Well, one of the things that struck me from the outset was 
you know, all the reviews talk about how hilarious it is. And it's, it's really hilarious. Uh, even while you real, I mean, I laughed out loud a couple of times, even while you realize this man is suffering, you know, he's suffering and he's, he's OCD. Um, he's nostalgic for what no longer is. Um, but I guess I, I would see it as sort of providential moments that arise that thwart his attempts. And it's like, he's always called to help somebody um, that he has to step outside himself, his own grief, his own pain, his isolation. And uh, <laughs> he can't commit suicide because somebody needs help, even though he gives it grudgingly. And um, that just seems to be very transformative for him little by little, you know, yeah. that connection with the outer world. He clearly has a heart of gold, mm -hmm. of, you know, deep inside all that's going on and, you know, with him. And it's very interesting you put, you know, you put that out that every single thing he does that's positive, it's almost as if, as you put it, begrudgingly um, does it whether it's, um, you know, helping um, the woman drive, uh, mm -hmm. driving her husband to the hospital or driving her to the hospital to see her husband, uh, taking care of the kids uh, for that small amount of time. And the kids, very interesting, see this and almost see it as funny um, and immediately get a connection with him, which I thought was interesting. Um, and, um, it's just, it is funny, but it's tragic at the same time. There's no question about it. Um, and, uh, I saw an interview with, I haven't seen the film with Tom Hanks, but I saw an interview with him a, about a week ago and he said he just loved playing the role. You know, it's not many times you can just, you know, be, um, I love the word curmudgeon, um, a curmudgeon and growl at people and complain all the time, um, whether it's buying the flowers and wanting to get the discounted price and just not understanding why it can't be, you know, one for one half of the price, et cetera. And it's interesting that at some grocery stores, even here, they do that you know, it's not one half, you have to buy two to get the buy one, get one free. Um, and it's just someone who is stuck in a different world, uh, which is interesting. Um, how he deals with the neighbors. Uh, what's his first introduction to the um, uh, neighbors? Uh, Patrick and Parvane. What is that first introduction? Do you remember? Them driving down the street and driving onto his flower bed that has no flowers in it. <laughs> yeah. And backing up and hitting his. Yeah. Um, uh, and I love the fact that this constant theme of you can't drive here. <laughs> You know, this, this is not a neighborhood in which you can drive. And it's, you kind of ask yourself, you know, why can't you? Um, uh, and um, he seems to have everything that everyone needs. Mm -hmm. So he's immediately put in a position where, whether it's, um, I, I love the uh, misinformation about, you know, my uh, heaters are bleeding you know, what do I do? And, you know, he just gets so exasperated when people don't understand him. Mm -hmm. um, he just assumes that people should understand on a level uh, that he does, um, whether it's at work or, um, you know, in the neighborhood or wherever. Um, you know, the scene when Patrick's at the hospital and him quote unquote, beating up the clown it is hysterical on the one mm -hmm. hand, you know, he wouldn't give me back my coin or whatever. Mm -hmm. And him being tossed out of the hospital and not allowed back. Um, but um, 
the way the story is told is very interesting. It's it's not disjointed. It, it gives you pieces. It gives mm -hmm. you a little bit about him, but not the complete picture. Um, which I, you know, there's there's a few movies like that. Um, I immediately thought of Pulp Fiction and Inception that tell the story out of order. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, there was a question. There uh -huh. was the question here in like uh, books, in um, like forty questions for a books for a book club about this book, and it was asking, why do you think Bachman wrote the story in a non chronological format, mm -hmm. and do you agree with his choice? So those are always interesting when they're written in like a non chronological mm -hmm. format. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, it, I think. Um, it's kind of stream of consciousness on the one mm -hmm. hand. Yeah. On the other hand, it keeps the reader uh, engaged. It's kind mm -hmm. of like, well, what piece of information are we going to get next? Um, right. You know, the kid um, uh, who's allergic to the cat and has to be rushed to the hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just like one thing after another and then being not forced, but pretty much forced to have the cat in the house. And um, the cat plays, I think, a wonderful role. You know, personally, I don't like cats myself. And he does everything to scare the cat away, to get rid of it. But he also was walking the cat through much of the book, which I think is hysterical, brings it to uh, his wife's grave with him um and talks to the cat and feeds the cat uh and ultimately it's one of his connections with reality i think and something to care about that he's not really forced to um and i think that's really special on the one hand and helps make him more um of a human character um i've written one of the reviews that um Literally, this story, let me see if I can find it, um, that uh, the author, um, let's see, he found a website about a man named Ova explode with rage while buying tickets at an art museum until his wife intervened. And my wife read the post and said, this is what life is like with you. <laughs> and um, he said, I'm not very socially competent. I'm not great at speaking to people. My wife tends to say your volume is always a one or 11, never in between. And this was his idea. Literally, he got this idea for the book from this. And this was his first book. And he got, I think, um, had trouble getting it published, and it's, I believe, 2.8 million copies in 30 <laughs> languages now, and he nor the publisher understand why. Mm -hmm. uh, if you've ever studied literature, I see him as, um, in the Middle Ages, they call him the, the everyman. Mm -hmm. This can mm -hmm. be you. And, um, you know, when you get exasperated, when things aren't working 100%, uh, I love the interplay between the Zob and whatever, you know, different cars. Um, it's just hysterical to me because some people, you know, only buy one type of car mm -hmm. and that's it. Um, I recall many years ago, my late wife, um, I went to the store to get Neosporin. That was her cure-all for everything. And <laughs> a generic brand. And she said, no, no, I wanted Neosporin. I said, the ingredients are identical. <laughs> and she was not comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, people are very much brand oriented, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's electronics or automobiles. And um, the fact that 
his father taught him how the world worked through teaching him how the car worked, I thought was absolutely fascinating. And, you know, they rarely had any contact other than that. And, um, you know, just this idea of this poor kid growing up on his own and having to literally become socialized in a very odd way, um, as a lot of people are when they lose a parent or a very important person to them. Um, my um, children, I've got two I adopted and two that are stepchildren from my marriage. They lost both their father and their mother. And you can see almost the um, what's missing in the socialization of them. Um, the past couple of years, I immediately felt for two different groups of people with COVID. Mm -hmm. The first were um, high school seniors, okay, missing out that year and then also college freshmen. But the other was kindergarten. Mm -hmm. You know, that is the time that is so important for a child. And these are kids that can't even, you know, touch someone, be hugged by someone, um, uh, be read to by someone in person. And I saw that in him as well. Mm -hmm. uh, this um, kind of awkward upbringing that he had no control over whatsoever. And um, he made the best out of it he could, I think. And then meeting his wife um, was you know, just incredible, the way he fell in love meeting and uh, he taking the train every morning to try to meet her um and then not um eating um or eating beforehand so she could have whatever she wanted i think was so dear and so mm -hmm. did she also uh it's just that when you look at people and don't see them for in a three-dimensional manner um you really miss who the person is, that uh, people don't have the same opportunities, um, whether it's a social group, uh, you name it, um, and that hurts them in their growth. And the fact that um, he was constantly trying to better his situation, with um, going to college, getting an engineering degree, with the help of his wife kind of pushing him along. But he did get this and he could improve the house, et cetera, which um, is very important to him. Um, all of this really touched me about it. And the scenes were a mixture of, as I mentioned, a comedy and tragedy at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, you almost wanted to grab him by the hand and help him through certain situations. Uh, losing his only friend in the neighborhood uh, who ended up being his arch enemy uh, through taking over the HOA, so to speak. Mm -hmm. It was funny, right before this uh, Zoom, uh, my HOA had a meeting on Zoom. <laughs> and I was thinking about these ridiculous complaints that people were having. And this um, the fact that he felt like he was stabbed in the back by his neighbor who took over. And basically, none of the neighbors wanted him to be the head of their neighborhood group, whatever. Um, and then this woman uh, that enters his life um, is clearly cares about him deeply. And I don't know what that says about her relationship with her very awkward husband. 
uh, there's something in there that I don't know about, but clearly she has very deep feeling for him, uh, whether it's from delivering the food at the beginning to, you know, hugging him uh, when he agrees to teach her to drive. And when she says she's not, uh, he says she's not an idiot. And it, it really, you know, helps her and bonds them together. Um, I, th I was very touched by that. Um, I don't know, what did, what did you think about her relationship with him and her non-relationship with her own husband? Did that strike you at all, either of you? I don't think I got quite that far into the book. Uh, I didn't quite get to the halfway mark. Okay. And, uh, but I noticed that she seemed to, um, she and the seven-year-old seemed to see through him in a lot of ways. But yes. there was also kind of a compassionate bond. But one of the things that really struck me was the way in which Sonia sort of functioned as his superego. Because I, yeah. the first number of pages, I didn't realize she was dead. Uh, because he would yeah, say, Sonia. Not. I look at her, she looks at her, he does, she doesn't say anything. She doesn't, and then finally I realize she's died, and then it says she died six months ago. But but it's like almost everything that he does, he reflects on how Sonia would respond to it or what she might say afterwards. And she's become sort of his conscience. And then it it, it you know it kind of struck me that. Well, he have the, had the guidance of his father. Again, the father died when he was still young. And um, Sonia then became kind of the arbiter of how he should live his life. Yes. Um, one of the things that, you know, right at the end of one of the chapters, when he said that he wasn't alive until he met her and that he wasn't alive anymore after she died. But I, I kept thinking, but he has kept her alive by adverting to her mm -hmm. as, uh, you know, to help judge what he ought to do in a situation, even when he doesn't want to do it. He doesn't want to help. And yep. when he runs into a burning building, you know, all those things. Um, but but it's kind of like, you know, what would Sonia do? <laughs> what would Sonia tell me to do? Um, so I didn't get too far with the relationship with the, the one he originally called that foreign woman, you know, the foreign pregnant woman. Well, um, it's very much one sided, the other one, but yeah, I, I agree with you completely. There's no way to know she's dead until the author tells you. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, it's interesting, um, you know, losing my wife and literally a dog at the beginning of the year. Um, you know, you look places, you feel things. Um, you almost speak to them and mm -hmm. there's, you know, that's part of your life, you know, a lengthy part of your life. And clearly it got him out of his, uh, shell. Uh, we thought, uh, when my mother died that my father was going to go, you know, typically when a spouse goes, sometimes the other goes quickly. Yeah because she was very much the social part of that marriage. And he lasted for 15 years. And we mm. were in absolute shock about it. Um, and he did very well uh, for a lengthy period of time. Um, but um, the conversations he has with her, um, the way he keeps, again, the when he's going to hang himself, he moves the picture. <laughs> yeah. Because he doesn't want her to see him. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, you know, come on. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. The fact that he read, um, uh, is it in the book? I'm not, uh, because I watched the um, Swedish version, some of it, um, that he returns the rope to the hardware store. Oh, <laughs> It's kind of like you said this will, you know, it's good for everything. <laughs> and that's typical, you know, of people. You know, you buy something, you know, you look at what the labeling says, 
And he was just literally at the end of his rope, um, you know, trying to make sense of his life. And this one thing, um, you know, lets him down. Um, and then, you know, in the midst of trying all that, there's a knock at the door, there's needing of help. And um, you can tell that my feeling was, why didn't he close the curtains? You know, um, he closed one set of blinds, but they didn't close the curtains because he could hear the children and see the children playing. Um, it's It's like, a lot of people, when they go to commit suicide, it's it's an act that they want to be stopped from, uh, for one reason or another. Uh, and I think he was learning that people did need him um, and started to enjoy it um, in a very, very interesting way. Um, you know, not everyone understands how much they are needed and how much they're connected to other people. Uh, when people totally remove themselves from other relationships, uh, it's so damaging to them. And it's kind of like an anchor. Um, you know, you don't have to be close, but just to have someone needing to borrow something like, um, you know, his neighbors are borrowing tools from him and uh, borrowing his expertise, you might say. Um, and I just love the interplay with, uh, I wish we could have seen more of the interplay with he and Runa, uh, rather than just kind of a memory um, and a passing idea about it about their talking about cars, about their talking about the neighborhood, um, him going through, and uh, I was immediately reminded of my father when he was going through the neighborhood and writing down people's license plates. Because uh, my dad, I, friends of mine couldn't believe this when I told them, but when they saw it, my father always carried a little black book with him and wrote down every single penny he spent, whether it was a tip or whatever, and then would check that night his wallet. Um, but here is a man looking for order as much as he can. And when it, it's disruptive, um, he does everything he can to get it back to the way he wants it, uh, whether it's in his little world or outside when he's shopping. Um, and he just doesn't understand the world around him outside of his house, which I think is very interesting. His house is his anchor. Um, the fact that um, he has to get dressed and prim and proper to commit suicide. It, it's kind of like, why? <laughs> um, and um, it's just, that's who he is. He wants to have that. So when he's discovered, it's not a terrible thing. And he lays plastic down. Um, it's interesting in the film, um, the Swedish film, um, he doesn't do that, but in the book, he's so careful mm -hmm. uh, and planning it out. It's very, very interesting. It's almost like getting ready for a mob hit, you know, the way they do, mm -hmm. you know, putting plastic and rolling the body in. Um, but uh, well, I think that, that again is, I mean, some of it's kind of the OCD characteristics, you know, that it inspects the neighborhood at 10 minutes to six every morning. But, but I think also the, the dressing up and wanting the house to look okay. Mm -hmm. I think that's, again, Sonia, the superego, you know, that when, when he meets her, he doesn't want to be chastised for being sloppy, for not being proper, <laughs> etc. Mm -hmm. And, um, and he kind of, you know, it, it, Bachman expresses that as part of his thought process. Yeah. It is uh, genuineness with 
burst the wallet that he found as a, a child. And his father, knowing that he was thinking about keeping it, but, you know, and then telling him, you did the right thing. You did have a choice and you chose. And then paying her back the money for the ticket and making sure that he was working off his father's back wages and things. Um, you know, clearly here was a person who wanted to make things right with everybody. Um, and um, just you know, very, very interesting. If you've seen people like that, uh, who go at lengths to be comfortable with their, their own self, let alone um, those around them. And you look at things you know, around us and you see people lying, cheating, stealing, et cetera. And here's this person who was just so genuine with everything he does. Um, that's the type of thing that really struck me, that this is a good person. Uh, this is someone he would like to know even with his um, oddities, so to speak. Um, putting the bike in the, uh, locking the bike up in the shed, making sure all of the sheds are locked, going from one to the next. Um, uh, I could see my father doing that. I mean, without question, my father was a, um, a plus personality. I used to be, trust me, over the years, I have really loosened up. Um, and it's amazing how people need this, you know, um, order structure in their life and how he, everything he did, uh, putting the newspapers on the, seat of the car. Yeah, was just hysterical to me. Um, and um, making sure the cat was taken care of properly and talking to the cat, um, I think was just hysterical. Um, but I could see this happening with almost anyone who has lost such an important, um, I don't even know how to put a rudder in their life. Mm -hmm. He, he uh, depended on her so much, even when she was ill. He did things constantly for her, and it was part of the structure. Um, and um, you know, the uh, him constantly trying to fight against City Hall, if you will, uh, was something. Looking for the uh, the right answer, trying to get people to treat others fairly as much as possible. Um, and it happens later on hysterically when um, the white shirts come at it even more so in the book. Um, and I love that, that term, the white shirts. Uh, this idea of these people that are... Um, there's no name, there's no identification other than they're, you know, formal. Um, they're government employees, if you will, or whatever. And that's all he has to know them by. Um, and um, his interplay with them just gets more and more interesting throughout um, the book, um, you'll see. Um, the book gets more and more interesting as you're going through it. It becomes less and less disjointed and the narrative becomes tighter. Um, it's a very interesting way of writing, um, I thought, uh, the way he introduced parts of his life um, and uh, parts of his family. Um, you know, just very, very interesting. And, the overall theme of everything can change in a heartbeat, in a moment. Right. And um, boy, is that true. 
you know, um, whether it's illness, accident, um, you name it, in a, in a person's life, things can happen uh, completely out of your control that can turn your life upside down. Um, and um, it's, um, you know, if, if you, you know, young people, uh, people college age I've dealt with for a very long time. They are um, a typical thing that's said about them is they think they're going to live forever. Uh, most of them haven't had, um, you know, death of a close one. They are completely immortal. And then when you see something happen, um, you know, and you see how it can affect someone so quickly and affect them at their, you know, root, um, their very uh, legs they stand on is, um, you know, amazing how he had to restructure his uh, home and his life uh, while his wife was alive. Um, you know, people just don't understand that, that um, if you're not ready for the unexpected, there's so much that can happen, whether it's having a will, a uh, power of attorney, uh, or th many things like that, insurance for that matter. Um, you know, these things can happen in a moment's time. Um, and um, again, when it uh, really shakes a person at their foundation when it does happen. Um, and January 1st, January 1st, um, my boyfriend's aunt, her husband finally passed away and he had, um, he died from cancer. I forget where it was. I, I believe it was the pancreas and it, it, it was, it was about two or three years and he lived about two years longer than they all expected he would. Oh. But this last year was a, very painful and it was a lot, it was a lot um she was she had to stop working she was working she's 80 but she was working at the probate court and she just worked like two or three days a week just to get out of the house and do something and um she had to stop because she had to become his full-time care caregiver and so I think of her when you when you speak because um it's been she now has gone back to actually working because she doesn't she's been home I would, I, I, I would meet her for breakfast until about like six months ago. And she couldn't leave him. She couldn't leave the house. She, everything was getting delivered to the house because if she left and he needed something or she could leave if, if a nurse was there, she could run out real quick. But if he needed something, she needed to be there to give it to him right away. And so within 24 hours after he passed away, um, all the medical equipment was out of the house. She was just like, I want all of this, this done and gone. I'm, I'm, I don't want this reminder here anymore. I want all the equipment out. Um, when we went over there, he died on the first. And so we were over there Saturday. No, we were over there Thursday for the funeral. I forget, I think the first was Sunday. So Thursday was the funeral and all, she had all his clothes in the trunk already. She was like, here, here, can you do something with these clothes? So we took all the clothes. So that wow. we could do something with them, and I was like, "Wow!" I mean, the, the grandchildren and the children came and took what they wanted, um, you know, like, and, and they took stuff that they wanted to make their teddy bears and their different things, pillows and things. But she had everything else that was done, and she didn't need. And she was she was done, and and she wanted stuff out of the house so that she could just move on with the rest of it. And I would talk to her and afterward. She said. This is just really tough because I don't know what to do with my baby now. Like, you know, and she ended up, I think she ended up going back to working three or four days a week right now at the probate court, like just to, just to go back. And she said, it's just tough going back because figure out what she's going to do because she's been the caretaker for two years. You know, she was like the only thing. And now she's got to go back into another role. And it's just like, then try to figure out, I think, you know, to, you 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 lose that extra that social security income and so you have to figure <laughs> out all these your house can you afford everything still 
you know and I just look around at somewhat because I, I don't know I guess because I'm in my 40s now and I'm like how much of this would I really need or my neighbor that you know has congestive heart failure she lives in her basement that she converted into an apartment when her husband had Alzheimer's a couple of years ago and he came home from the, from the hospital. So she made the bottom floor their living space. She has an entire house above her. She has bedrooms, bathrooms, kitchen, living room, the entire furnished house above her that does not get used at all, you know? And I just, I, I thought that she, I thought somebody, I thought her family lived above her and she lived downstairs and she said, nope, it's just me in this house, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wow, she's just, so now, you know, she was, when she came out of the hospital, excuse me, this last time. God bless you. When she came out of the hospital the last time, she said, I was thinking I was just going to go to the nursing home just to make it easier, you know, on everybody in the and all her family. And all I thought is, she's got immaculate yard, immaculate gardens, mm -hmm. you know, and this gorgeous house. And really all that's left then is like two suitcases. Like mm -hmm. just to leave like all mm -hmm. of that behind is very, um, I don't know, it's very, it's a very sad feeling. It's a very like final feeling. It's a very like you've worked your whole life or, you know, it's just a very interesting, different feeling. It's interesting I that you mentioned that because in the book, it's clear that he has kept mementos, um, mm -hmm whether it's pictures um, or, you know, getting a 93 sob instead of a 92 sob, same color as the one his father had. So he's got all these things that memorialize, but it doesn't really say what he had done. At least I, I didn't, I, I, I didn't clearly finish it, but it doesn't really say like what happened to her things. Uh, what about her favorite chair, things like that. And people grieve so differently because I've known people like, you know, the, the woman you're talking about that got rid of things so quickly, you would think like it's hard hearted or something, you know. And then on the other hand, people who years after. Yeah, are, and I remember somebody asked me why my mother still wore her wedding and engagement ring. She wore it 48 years after my father died, you know, and people thought, well, she should have had taken them all off, you know, and um, it, it's just it's so different it's very so, interesting how everybody yeah. handles grief because i was like yeah. you know you're ready are you sure you want me to take this stuff are you mm -hmm. sure you, you know and she was just like i just you know i want to remember all the good times and i want yeah to, yeah and and i and i get it I, I mean i get it and i get everybody grieves differently you know um years ago we did relationship training classes when we're like early 20s and one of the things we learned is that sometimes the older we get the more of a, a tighter circle our life becomes mm -hmm. so it's not as wide spread out it's it's mm -hmm. more of a and it was kind of almost like learning to like guard against even becoming this closed-minded tight circle and continue to expand your horizons continue to expand the you know what you have you know continue you know so it was um it was um a, an interesting thing to see and learn and we had mm -hmm. an older class that were in their my 20s they must have been in their 60s was the older couple in the class then um i mean they've both passed on the past five years now and probably were in their later 70s but it was just so um, interesting for them to go, oh, you know what? I'm going to guard. I'm, that is true. That does happen. I see that happening to me. And I'm going to stop. I'm going to work on that not happening. When I yeah. um, visit someone, for instance, who's grieving, uh, the first thing I tell them is there's no rules. You are going to deal with it your way and don't let anyone tell you how to deal with it um you are going to hear something you're going to see something you're going to smell something that's going to trigger feelings and that's okay okay there's just no rules um um nothing happens in a distinct order 
Um, and uh, length of time also, there's no way of knowing how it's going to take. Um, when um, my wife passed away, it was interesting that uh, she passed away on a Friday evening. And Monday, I went to school to teach. And my the chair of my department met me in the hallway and gave me a big hug. And he was crying. And he said, you don't have to be here today. And I said, this is how I deal with things in my life. You know, this has been an anchor in my life for so long. Um, it has gotten me through things. Um, that and my dogs, to be honest with you, um, that have been so supportive in my life. Um, and um, we had this agreement that uh, she was in the hospital for two weeks before she passed away. I would teach my classes and then go to the hospital. And that's when I did my office hours over the phone. And it was interesting, I keep... Um, brought a pizza for her when he had the pizza place. <laughs> and uh, that was so touching. And she actually ate a piece. And it was just kind of a little bit more reality um, in her life. And, um, you know, people deal with things completely differently. And that's fine. My guess is, I mean, you said it, it didn't say about the chair. I think you gave the example. My guess is it was in the same place she had it because the clothing was all there, et cetera. And the kitchen was left the way it was. Um, but my guess is the things were where they were uh, for him. Um, that's the way he would have dealt with it. Um, not positive, mind you, but I certainly get that idea. Um, and that's tragic on the one hand, but that helps the person who's grieving on the other, you know, it's their way of dealing with it, which, you know, some people say, oh, you've got to let go. And why, you know, if that's the most important part of your life, um, for me, that's gotten, what's gotten me through the most difficult times, I think I mentioned this the other night at the dinner, was the Buddhist idea of um, the first noble truth is that all is suffering. And ultimately, what you should do to avoid suffering is to avoid attachment to things. That doesn't mean don't have relationships. It's just be realistic that everything is impermanent. And that's the teaching of the Buddha also. And if you can do that, you're still enjoying, you're still loving, but you're also knowing that ultimately this is gonna to happen to that person, to me or to that person, or to this um, you know, piece of machinery a car, whatever, it's not going to last forever. Uh, you know, it's when you see people who bought a car and they get the first scratch on it, it's like, oh my God. And, um, you know, it's a machine. It gets you from one place to another. Get over it. Why uh, I love it is why a used car has already got a scratch because then I'm done. I'm, I'm all good. I don't have to worry yeah. about it anymore. <laughs> my mechanic years ago it was a guy incredibly great guy we were wonderful friends and he never let anyone he worked on high performance cars rolls royces jaguars lamborghinis etc he never let anyone watch him while he was working on a car because he'd get in the engine he'd bang away and whatever he knew what he was doing he just did it on his own time and in his own way and uh, would never be pushed. You never ask them when it's going to be ready. Um, because, you know, he always said, hey, look, you crash it, you fix it. Big deal. Uh, I will tell you, and I agree with that because my boyfriend's a mechanic and we've had some vehicles that he's taken the front bumpers off, the hoods off, the whole axle in order to get the engine out. 
And one time our, he did that with our friend's van and they came in and they forgot something in the van they needed to get. And they came <laughs> out of the shop to come get it. And he saw like the front, like the whole front of his vehicle was gone. And he was just like, whoa. And I was like, oh man, I don't usually let people see this because this is kind of scary. Because it can, it can really freak you out to see. <laughs> I mean, you to learn everything comes apart. Yeah. Similarly, when cooking, you know, so you don't want to know. <laughs> um, I saw something on TV the um, years ago. Um, it was two hours of, you know, one was the deli slicer, the invention. Absolutely incredible, you know. And then it was the creation of deli meat. Now, when I saw them making olive loaf, if you saw that process, you wouldn't touch it. You wouldn't buy it. I bet. Yeah. <laughs> but it was, you know, just very interesting. You don't want to know what goes into salamis or hot dogs or whatever, but hey, they're pretty good in the long run. Yeah. Not for nothing, when you learn how eggs are made from a chicken, you might not really want to eat it, but we all still eat it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, process is interesting. Uh, you know, the way things are made and um, it, it's just fascinating, you know, how they make different things and um, our society and how we look at different things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he wanted everything to be a certain way. And many of us are the same way. You know, we're used to things a certain way. Um, it's interesting when you go to a different country and go to into a supermarket, you, you can't tell what things are because they're packaged differently. Mm -hmm. You know, the simplest thing is like milk is in a bag. You know, who would have thought of that <laughs> or something like that? Um, yeah, oh, you ever read Who Moved My Cheese? Excuse me? You ever read the book Who Moved My Cheese? Yes. <laughs> right. I was going to say it's almost kind of like there's a little bit of like that kind of tendency. Oh, I got, I got to tell you a quick story. We'll end this. Um, there was um, a, a girlfriend of mine was visiting and we had this room that was added on to our house where the television was. It was like a porch, but it was uh, finished off. And I said to her, after my father left to get a drink or something, I said, watch this. And I moved something on the table in between the, his chair and my chair about 20 degrees, okay? came into the room and he's looking around like something's wrong. And all of a sudden he looks down and he puts it, turns it back to the exact spot it was in because that was so important to him. Um, it, it's just hysterical how some people, um, you know, People, some people put their keys. I put my keys in the same place. Um, and other people end up uh, finding them in the freezer, in their house or whatever, uh, or the glasses, you know, the typical one, where are my glasses? Well, they're on your head, you know. Um, and people just get so used to the way things are. Uh, and in his case, clearly it's uh, OCD, to the mm -hmm. point, of, this is what keeps him going. Um, so, um, but uh, some great comments, some very, very good comments about this. Um, and we've got it scheduled for what day? Um, the next one? These um, I forget what date the next one is. Is it the um, well, next one is March 16th. Okay, I think you're right. Awesome. So it's exactly question. a month. Exactly a month. Okay. Yeah. And I'm going to make sure that everybody else is aware and on. And so yeah. you know, if you're on and you have anything that you'd like to share, um, I know you didn't, you didn't get to um, stop and say anything. 
Um, Hi, hello everyone. I I read that book in the book club I, I belong to. Then I saw the movie, the Swedish version of that, and now he's running in the picture house, a man called Otto with the Tom Hank. Right? Sorry, hmm. I joined I joined late. I joined like after half an hour, so I missed the, the beginning of it. Not a problem. <laughs> we will um we'll be back on the 16th of March. Will you be able to join us then? Which book we are reading? Yes. That same book? A man called over yeah, or the same second book. Same book, the same book. We're gonna have more more of a discussion. Oh, okay. Okay. I'll be. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Right, because thank I, you. I, I really, I, I'm sorry, but I wasn't home and I joined very late. Not a problem. We appreciate it. I, I love the programs you do. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thanks. See you in a week. Um, and I guess well, in a month. And I'll see you in a week, uh, Christina, I guess.